Thank you, Matt, for that scripture reading, the prayer, and John for the songs. You know, when I told my wife what the uh, topic would be for my lesson this morning, she got a little nervous. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be a little bit different this morning. Tony invited me to do this, by the way, so we put it on Tony. All right, so the biggest issue that Christians face today, anybody have any ideas? What, what would you say that is? Anyone? Anyone? Just, Okay, confidence. Well, I'm going to put forth something a little different this morning. I'm going to say it's zombies. That's going to be the biggest issues that Christians face today, zombies. Now, if you think about that, and I'll give you a little background why I came up with this. Um, it's that time of year, right? Halloween was yesterday. You get all these previews on television, the scary movies that, that are starting to come on. You go in the stores, they have the Halloween displays, and pretty much in all that, you're going to find zombies somewhere, right? They're there. They're out there. So what hit me as I was reading a verse, and I'm going to be um, using the book of Ephesians this morning, you know, I read a verse in that, and it hit me. Yeah, we're, we're living among zombies right now. Not only right now, we have always been living among zombies because they've always been there. And not only that, some of us were zombies ourselves at one time. And now you're going to have to bear with me this morning. You know, it seems odd. This, this is it's a little bit different, right? So the first thing I need to do is to, to define what a zombie is. And to do that, anybody familiar with this? The Zombie Survival Guide, right? It's a great book, by the way. Purely fiction. Very entertaining, though. I love it. I, about every page I read, I laughed. It's great. So the zombie survival guide, you know, the um, author tells us it's not black magic, it's not something supernatural, but it's a virus. The Solanum virus is what's responsible for zombies. I'm going to read the passage here. Again, this is purely fictional, by the way. Solanum works by traveling through the bloodstream from the initial point of entry into the brain. Through means not yet fully understood, the virus uses the cells of the frontal lobe for replication, destroying them in the process. During this period, all the bodily functions cease. By stopping the heart, the infected subject is rendered dead. The brain, however, remains alive but dormant while the virus mutates its cells into a completely new organ. Again, fictional people, this is not real. Um, the most critical trait of this new organ is its independence from oxygen. By removing the need for this all-important resource, the undead brain can utilize, but is in no way dependent upon the complex support mechanism of the human body. Once mutation is complete, the new organ reanimates the body into a form that bears little resemblance, physiologically speaking, to the original corpse. Some bodily functions remain constant, others operate in a modified capacity, and the remainder shut down completely. This new organism is a zombie, a member of the living dead. And it's that last part I'm going to focus on, the living dead. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. And you were dead in your offenses and sins in which you previously walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all previously lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the rest. So notice here that first verse, and you were dead. They're dead. Those people out there, they're dead. They don't know it. In the second verse, but they're walking. They're walking around. So it's the living dead, and it fits this definition for me, and that's what struck me. And I'm a little odd sometimes, but, you know, there's zombies out there, the living dead. They don't know it yet. They don't understand it. And again, the risk is real not only for us that are Christians to fall back into that, but I'm going to put forth our greatest job as Christians it's to go after those individuals. That's what we're to do, to go after the living dead and to bring them into our fold. So what I'm going to use this morning on the back of this handy book here, we've got the top 10 lessons for surviving a zombie attack. So this is going to be my outline I'm going to use. You know, these, these are going to come in handy. And again, they're quite entertaining. So again, bear with me. All right, the top 10 lessons, number one, organize before they rise. You've got to be organized. 
You've got to be prepared. If you're not prepared, you've already failed. You've already lost. We have to organize. It's a good point, right? Number two, they feel no fear. Why should you? And I'm going to go into that a little bit deeper. They're dead, right? What should they fear? Why should they fear? Do they fear? Number three, use your head, remove theirs. Now, you know, this is a little bit tougher here, people. But we'll get to it. So you want to use your head, but we're not going to physically remove theirs. Number four, it's my favorite. Blades don't need reloading. Now think about that. That's really deep, right? You're in battle here. You don't want to have to reload anything. You don't want to carry extra ammunition. You want to be ready, you know. You don't want to have to reload. So we're going to talk about that. Number five, ideal protection, tight clothes and short hair. Think about it, you know. They get a hold of you, you can be infected, right? You don't want that. Number six, get up the staircase, then destroy it. What do you know about zombies, you know? They can't build a ladder. You're not worried about that. They respond to sound. That's how you get them close to you. If you're too loud, they're going to come for you. After a period of time, the bodies can pile up. They can climb on top of themselves and get you. Leads us to the next one. Get out of the car and onto the bike. Cars are loud. Bikes are not. You want to get away, right? Number eight, keep moving, keep low, keep quiet, and keep alert. You want to have the element of surprise, you know, on your side, not theirs. Number nine, no place is safe, only safer. It's really deep, right? Only safer. And finally, number 10, the zombie may be gone, but their threat lives on. The threat's always there. It's never gone until the final days. So this is going to be my outline. I'm going to expand on the first five today, um, due for time. Um, so number one, organize before they arise. All right. So we're a little late here, right? They're out there. They've always been out there. Some of us were part of them at one time. You know, at one time here in our history, we, we know that everyone on the earth was a living dead except eight people, right? And God come in, he took care of all those individuals, and he let those eight people live. We know the story. But God's organization for us began in the beginning, before we were created, before we created man at all. That, that was there. He had a plan in play. And it was going to be played out. As you go through the Old Testament, you know, you've got to really pay attention. The lesson's there. The church is there being built. The threat of Christ begins in Genesis, and it follows all the way through. And it's the building of the church, and that was God's plan. That was his organization that was to be built to do battle, and that's what we need. So we needed Christ to come into the world. Um, you know, he's going to be the great cornerstone. We needed a priest that could forgive our sins, that could wash them away, not only forgive them, but wash them away. So Christ is that great cornerstone. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. So then you are no longer strangers or foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So again, we have the church here. There's no hope without the church. I mean, people say that, I'm a good person. This, there is no hope whatsoever without the church. It was designed, you know, before man was created. That was God's design. So we have the church and in those verses, it says it was built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone. We're going to get to that a little bit more. But we have a blueprint. We have it laid out. We have this organizational structure put forward for us. It's there. It's perfect. It's complete. It will do everything it's supposed to do. And we're the weak link because sometimes we want to change things, right? I'm human. I know a little bit better. I can do things a little bit better. I can tweak. That don't need to be in there. Or I need to add something a little bit more to it. It don't work that way. It's there. It's perfect. It's complete. We've got to follow it. If we want to survive and thrive out in this world, the living dead, we have to follow this organization. Number two, they feel no fear. Why should you? So do the living, the living dead feel fear? Are those out in the world that are dead, do they feel fear? What about those of us that have walked that walk before? 
that walk with death. Did you feel fear when you were out in the world? You know, this is a difficult thing, and I think it's difficult not only for the non-believers, but believers also, having a good grasp of what fear is. Because we need fear, right? Fear keeps us alive. It keeps us alive. It keeps us safe. So we really have to understand what it is. To the um, unbelievers, the living dead, you know, what they lack is a fear of God. They don't understand what a fear of God is. Matthew 10 and 28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You know, that's what they should be afraid of. Not a physical thing, you know, something out in the world, but it's that eternal death. They need to understand that is real. That is something that, that they're going to experience. They need to know that, and many people don't know that. What about for believers? We should have a good understanding of the correct fear of God, but what we sometimes fail at is, wor fail at is worldly fear. You know, we're scared. We're scared of what the world has for us. We're scared of what the world can do to us physically. We're scared about our own health, our own well-being, and more so of our family members. You know, that's the fear we walk with that we shouldn't. The Bible does not teach that. Isaiah 41 and 10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will also help you. I will also uphold you with my righteous right hand. The Apostle John in Revelation 2 and 10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you will be tested. You will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. You know, we shouldn't live in the fear that the world offers. You know, we have the word of God and it's there for us to save us for eternity. We should be fearless knowing that. You know, we're going to live eternity in heaven if we follow what the Bible teaches. If we do that, there shouldn't be any fear in us except that the correct fear that we should have for God and his commandments. Number three, use your head, remove theirs. Again, this is a tough one. You're going to have to bear with me. We're going to have to work with it a little bit. So we know we're not going to physically remove the head of those that are walking out in the world and dead. But what we do need to do is remove that which guides them in their walk. And the correct way for us to do this is to use our head. And what is our head? We have a head, right? We've already talked about the church. So who's the head of the church? Ephesians 5 and 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. So here we have it. We have a head to guide us. And it's only through him that we're going to be able to turn those individuals from the world and their sinful ways to a way of life. It's only through Christ. It's the only way that we can do it. We look at Christ and his teachings, the way he handled different situations, and they go, you know, counter to what we think a lot. Um, you think about his encounter with the adulterous woman, you know, the sin that she was openly engaging in. What was his response to her? How did he respond to that sin? Did he condemn her right there in front of everybody? Did he make her feel about an inch tall? He didn't. He did it with mercy. With mercy. What about when he was at the table with the tax collectors and the sinners? Matthew chapter 9. His response in verse 13, Now go and learn what this means. I desire compassion rather than sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous but sinners. So we have a job. We have an example, the perfect example how we're to handle these situations. And they're all different, but the correct answers are in the Bible. We have to use it to, do the, to, to address these people correctly because we can push them away. You know, our job is a church and we have a job. This is not something you're baptized into, and I, and I just show up two days a week, three days a week, and that's it. That's not what the church is. We have a job, and it was designed that way. Again, we're to be out in the world saving those zombies that are out there. That's our job. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. 
the Great Commission. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So the Bible's our survival guide. It's there. Every answer is there. We have to look for it, though. We have a head. We have Christ as our head. You know, and there's no way we can save anyone without him. No matter what anybody tells you, we have to have Christ or there's not going to be any hope. All right, number four, my favorite. Blades don't need reloading. Every time I read this, it makes me laugh. When I first got the book, it was just great. I loved it. And I guess because I can really relate to it, you know, I grew up in the 80s. It's the height of the ninja fad. Anybody familiar with ninjas? I loved it. Bought the magazines. They actually had magazines, you know. Stuff looked real to me, right? Turns out mostly it was fake, but who cares? Bought the VHS tapes, those big tapes. Had to rent the actual player. Didn't have a player at home, yeah. And I think Andy was the one that talked about this. You could actually rent the VHS players. That's a foreign concept, right? But I loved it. I was a huge fan. You know, I grew up in Arbor. I don't really if everybody knows where Arbor is, if you don't, you probably need to take a drive and see it. It won't take but a minute, but, you know, it's there. Small town, probably less than 500 people. I grew up in the house. We lived on the highway. And you don't think about when you're young, when you're out in your imaginary world and you're playing, about the people driving by. You don't really think about that, right? But apparently when you're out there in a black ninja outfit, and it was an outfit, not a costume, I want to stress that, you have a sword strapped to your side, and you're throwing ninja stars. People pay attention to that. Because apparently, at school, the older students and some of the teachers gave me a name. I was known as the Arbert Assassin. I didn't know that. It's pretty impressive, right? But anyway, I had that sword. That wasn't a true sword. It was a true sword in the sense it looked like a sword. It was metal. It was an alloy. You couldn't sharpen it, but it had a sharp point. It looked real. I had the scabbard for it. I was good to go, right? I love that sword. Still got it, by the way. If anybody wants to see it. But anyway, one night my brother had a friend over, and being the good person that I was, I thought he probably needed to check out my ninja skills. So I, I got out in the living room, and I, I took my sword out. You know, there's a couple of different ways you can, you can pull a sword out. Well, I pulled that sword out, and I started whipping it around. You know, accidents happen. And that day, an accident did happen. But I learned some good lessons, right? I learned, you know, one, it's still a weapon. I was, I was very familiar with it. I think I actually slept with it sometimes. But it's a weapon. And you get familiar with something, and sometimes you take it for granted, right? Second thing I learned, that I do have performance anxiety. I'm sweating a little bit right now. My palms are sweaty. When I got that sword out, my palms were sweaty. It's about the third or fourth rotation on that sword. That sword changed its mind. It wasn't a sword anymore. It wanted to be a spear. So it took flight out of my hand underneath the front windows. Nice big window. Stuck in the drywall. Yeah, sweaty hands are a liability when you're handling a sword. I figured that out. But I love that sword. I learned to respect it. Still love swords to this day. But I have a great respect for them, especially since you don't have to reload them. Think about that. All right. So what does a sword need? If a sword's to be effective, what does it need? It needs somebody that is skillful to wield it, right? You've got to have the skill. It has to be sharp. It has to be taken care of. You have to condition your body to wield it. I mean, it takes some physical effort, trust me. If you're sitting there swinging that thing, you've got, your body has to be ready to do that over and over again. You have to prepare yourself. It also requires a good grip, by the way. If you don't learn that on your own, it may be too late when you learn it. So what swords do we as Christians wield? Well, we have a sword. It's the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians 6 and 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So we have it. There's no need to reload it. It's always there. It's always there for us. But we have to learn to wield it. We've got to train ourselves to use it properly. 
You know, it's a powerful, powerful weapon. You know, it requires constant dedication, constant study. And sometimes we forget how powerful it is. Hebrews 4 and 12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, even penetrating as far as the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It's a very powerful weapon, but it can be used incorrectly. It can hurt people instead of help people if we don't wield it correctly. And this has happened throughout the ages. And it's still held against us. You know, you hear it time and time again. Look at all the people that's died because of Christianity. And it's true, but was it true Christianity? No, it wasn't. It was wielded incorrectly. So we have to be sure that we use it in the correct manner. If we want to survive and save the living dead, we have to have this sword, the Word of God. Number five, ideal protection, tight clothes, and short hair. All right. It's a little difficult also. So the, um, the author of the Zombie Survival Guide, again, his suggestion here is you want to minimize the ability for the living dead to grab you. Because if they grab you, they can bite you, you can become infected, you can become one of them. We don't want to be one of them. So we have to have the appropriate attire when we're out in the world. We have to have it because we can. The risk is there that we can go back and become one of them. Um, the doctrines out there, once saved, always saved. Those people aren't reading their Bible because we're fixing to read a few verses here. There's no reason it would be here if that wasn't the case. I mean, the risk is always there that we can, we can go back to the sinful ways of the world. So what do we need? What type of attire do we put on to eliminate the risk? It's the armor of God. We're familiar with it. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist on the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having belted your waist with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having strapped on your feet the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Verse 11, he tells us, we've got to put on the full armor of God to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. If it wasn't a risk, why would he say that? I mean, why would Paul tell, and again, in this church, or this message that Paul has written here was to the church members at Ephesus. The threat is real. You know, the power that controls the living dead out in that world, it's strong. Sin is strong. The desire is strong. The temptation is strong. And if you don't believe that, then you're lying to yourselves. It's there. It's going to come after every one of us. He tells us here, you know, we're going to be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. It's just not one. It's arrows. It's multiple arrows. It's constant barrage of arrows coming after us. We've got to be prepared. It's my question to you this morning. Will you be willing to save others? Will you be able to save others that are out in the world? You know, the living dead that are out there. Because I put forth, it's our job. That's what we should be doing. I mean, it's not just showing up here for us. It's part of it, too. But we've got to be out after those because, will we survive. Many people don't survive out in the world. You know? Or have you reverted back already? Are you one of them? Are you walking in death right now? Are you without Christ in your life? In all seriousness, you know, this mission... It's real, it's before us, it's required of us. You know, we're making headways in third world countries that are eager for the word of God, that desire it, that have no other hope except God. They're listening for it. They're answering the call. But here in the U.S., what about us? What's the trend? What about our community? What are we doing? What do we see out there? You know, I heard someone say one time that if we preach a life-changing gospel, the people expect to see lives changed. 
Are they seeing our, our lives changed? Is your life, has your life been changed because of the gospel? Are people seeing that out in the world? Or are they seeing zombies like themselves? They need to see something different. They need to see that we are preaching this life-changing gospel. It does change lives, and it'll change everybody's life. It's there. We have to see it. This morning, if you're out in the world, if you're the walking dead, you need to get into the church. There's no other hope for you. There's nothing else there. You know, we have the, the head of the church, Christ. He's there. You, became, you can become part of this church. You know, we have the water ready. You can be baptized into the church. You can help us in this battle. It's an ongoing battle. It's always been there from the beginning. It'll always be there. But we need good workers. You know, if you have reverted back or you have sin in your life now and you need the help from the church, we can help you through prayers. We can help you through whatever means possible. We're willing to do that. If you have any need this morning, I pray that you'll come as we stand and sing this song.